Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. We have a lot of people online. You know, we have lots of folks online just sitting here watching us all over the world. You know, I was noticing we had some people from Australia watching last Wednesday. We had some folks. Hey, Ralph, good to see you, my friend. Love you. I hadn't seen you in a hot minute. So good to see you. But uh, anyway, I get a little distracted there, but I uh, hadn't seen him in a while. But, uh, but we have a lot of folks all over the world. I was actually watching uh, morning prayer yesterday morning. We were seeing a uh, good afternoon from Germany, good afternoon from Great Britain, you know. And we're, I mean, we have all kinds of folks just watching the service all over the world. So if you're here for the first time, you know, we, we have a card out on the, on the back seats. You know, just fill it out. Take it out to our guest services area. We would love to bless you. We'd like to know where that you're here. And if you're visiting for the first time online, there's a click here button. And, um, or you can also text hello to 612-712-7212. Amen. So are you ready to give? Amen. So as you're ready to give, we're going to, there's uh, information on your seat backs if you're given by paper, online, you know, there's all the information on your screen as we prepare the offering. And uh, last week, I actually just read a scripture from Luke 12, 29 through 31. Well, we're going to go back to that really quick. And uh, if you weren't here, I'll, I'll read it really quick. It says, I re- Jesus says, I repeat, don't let worry enter your life. Live above ang- anxious cares about your personal needs. People everywhere seem to worry about making a living. But your heavenly Father knows your every need and will take care of you. Each and every day, he will supply your needs as you seek his kingdom passionately above all else. Amen? He he says, don't allow, don't let worry enter in. Don't let worry. Worry is in the root system of fear. Fear is the opposite of faith. When you allow worry to enter in, fear begins to take root in your life. He says, don't let worry enter in. Then he says, live above anxious cares. Anxiety is another form of fear. It's in the root system of fear. You know, you heard Pastor Sean here talk about there's this healthy anxiety that, that's part of your brain that lets you know, hey, there's danger in the, in the wind. There's danger. It, there's, this, there's this mechanism that God put in place To let you know that, hey, danger, right? That's not what Jesus is talking about here. It's the habitual living and breathing worry and fear. You see, when you are living in worry and fear, you begin to see your job as your source. Instead of you get your eyes off of him who supplies all your needs. So now instead of working for a seed to give, you're working to try to meet your need in your own flesh. Amen? Whoo! Praise the Lord. So today... Refuse to worry. 
to allow worry to come in as a seed. Amen? Because he will meet your every need. He knows what you need already. Amen? So keep your eyes on him. I know we just had Leif Hetland here, right? You remember that? What Jesus is talking about is stay in chair number one, not in chair number two. Amen? Amen. Woo! Praise the Lord. So, Lord, I thank you, Father. Lord, I thank you that you're blessing those that that are giving today. We thank you that you meet our every need. I thank you, Father, that you are doing a new work in every one of our lives. Lord, bless them abundantly. Lord, because your word does say, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. But it starts with the giving first. I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. We're going to bring this down, down here. We've got a little object lesson here in a little bit. But praise the Lord. Well, I want to ask you to come back as they're giving offering. Come back this weekend for Resurrection Sunday. Amen? Pastor Mac is in the house all weekend long. And this is a great opportunity for you to to invite people in. We're going to put on... We go all out on Resurrection Sunday, and we we want you to bring people, invite people. It's going to be good, amen. I mean, let's put let's get real. Easter and Christmas is about, and Mother's Day is about the only time we can get the people in here that typically don't go to church, right? So bring them in, amen. Then come back next week. We have uh, Reverend Joe Morris. He's going to be in the house. He has a strong word with revelation of of end time events. And then while he's here, they're going to be recording another podcast on the Final Hour podcast. He's going to be with Pastor Jim one-on-one. You know, I don't know if you watched the last one. It was really good um, with Joe Morris. And I, I told Pastor Jim, I was like, my only beef about that last one with Joe Morris is that it wasn't long enough, you know. I mean, they, I think they only went, what, 30 minutes, and it was like, really? Come on. I just wanted more because it was so good. God is so good. When you're hungry for the word, it doesn't matter how long somebody preaches, you know. So, right? When you're hungry, when you're hungry for God. So, we got a lot of time. We got to go. We got to get moving because... We got about three hours to get in uh, in the one hour message, you know. You know, I, I uh, you know, my grandmother, my, my grandmother, I love her. I'm looking forward to seeing her again. Uh, she she lives in heaven today, you know. But man, she uh, she she got uh, she talked her pastor into into inviting her uh, on fire for God grandson to come preach. You know, I was what, I was 19, 20 years old, and uh, I was in Vivian, Louisiana, Church of God of Prophecy, and, um, and it happened to be the same pulpit that my grandfather pastored in when my mom was a little kid. So the first sermon I ever preached was behind my grandfather's pulpit. You know, and I'll never forget it. Her pastor said, came up to you and said, Michael, now I just want you to understand, you know, that a lot of Bible students, a lot of, lot of uh, young preachers, they have all these notes that they think they have enough notes to preach a whole entire hour's worth. And they get up there and they blow through their notes within 10 minutes. You know, so I just want you to know 
Don't be embarrassed if that happens. It's, it's okay because it happens to a lot of people. I actually came prepared with a message just in case that happens. I said, Pastor, thank you for your encouragement. I appreciate it. But you know what? You can put your notes away. You're not going to need those notes. Okay, I'm just saying. I said, thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. So after, after uh, praise and worship was over, he introduces me. I get to preaching, and I mean, I am just going to town. And we don't, didn't have a clock like we do here to keep track of time, right? I'm just preaching. I'm having a good time. And at some point in the message, I look over, and I locked eyes with my mother who was sitting in the second row, and she goes, So, so, so I, 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 I just quickly wrapped up, prayed, and dismissed everybody or gave it back to the pastor, you know, or whatever. And after we went out to eat, you know, I was like, I said, Mama, why, why'd, you, why'd you do this? I was in a really good flow here, you know. And she goes, do you realize when I went like this, you had been preaching for 90 minutes? I like, oh, no, I didn't know that, so... So, praise the Lord. I think I taught them everything I learned from Kenneth Copeland that day, you know, but praise the Lord. <laughs> so, thank you, Jesus. I just love teaching the Word. I love talking the Word. You know, I have two of my friends here. Man, we, we, we just, I love talking the Word. So, I, if I get excited, it's because I am. You know, John chapter 15 Jesus tells us that I am the vine, I am the true vine, the NIV says, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Jesus prunes the things that hinders us so we can grow. Amen? So he goes on to say in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you were here last week, we discussed the possibilities of why we don't have the power of God in our lives in America. I asked four simple but simple to read but very difficult questions to think about. And if you weren't here or watching online, those questions were could it be that we don't have the power of God in our lives because we know of Him? And we don't know him. I also asked, could it be that we are distracted? Amen. There's a lot of distraction in the world today. We're distracted by a lot of things. And the quicker we recognize that is a tool of Satan. Come on. Man, it's just really been in me a little bit lately. You know, I mean, I could be wrong. I don't know. I could be wrong. It's just something that's sitting in here. I think Satan has really convinced the church to dumb it down and say the enemy That's just a side thought. But, so Satan, once you realize that Satan is using distraction because he knows it will water down and pull us away from our relationship with the Father. We saw that in Scripture last week. Then I also brought up this question. Could it be because we know of him, not knowing him, 
that we're distracted, that we are in a state that we have lost our first love and have become lukewarm. And because of all of the above, could it be that we are disconnected from the vine and that we have lost our saltiness, our holiness? Because we see salty, the salt can, with too much distraction and too much other compounds all around it, the salt is still there. You just can't taste it. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? So, I'm not saying that you don't know Jesus. What I'm challenging all of us, including me, is that we need to dig deeper with knowing him and understanding the importance of knowing him. Because knowing him comes intimacy. I think, I'm convinced, there's too much believing in the body of Christ and not enough knowing. Woo, it got quiet in here. 2 Timothy 1.12. Paul is talking to Timothy and he says, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know in whom I have believed. Duh. Past tense. Notice when you're looking at that scripture. Believed. Paul got to the point where he no longer believed in Jesus into knowing him. There's a difference between believing and knowing. Big difference. I'm going to prove it to you. So, so let's say, let's say, you know, that we have a we have a large church, right? On a Sunday. You've seen this person, you know, because they sit in the same seat every Sunday, but because you sit in a different section of them, you you see them, you know of them, right? But you don't know them. Right? So they come up to you and say, you know what, by the end of the month, I'm going to give you five hundred dollars. I'm going to give you $500. Do you immediately begin to budget that $500 and figuring out how to spend it? No, you don't. Why? Because you believe they're going to give you $500. But let's say your dad comes up to you or your mom and says, you know what? At the end of the month, I'm going to give you $500. Within seconds, you're already spending that $500. Why? Because you know that they are a person of their word and that they are going to give you $500 at the end of the month. And within seconds, you already know how to spend it. The difference between believing and knowing. Do we believe that Jesus is going to do what he says he's going to do, or do we know? I am absolutely convinced that if we could go back in time and watch a video of every single miracle that we have experienced from God, we will see this process of Man, thank you, Jesus. I'm believing for this. I'm believing for this. I'm believing. You're praying. You're praying. You're praying. You're believing. You're believing. Believing. At some point, you cross the line from believing to where you're like, I know that I know that I know that I know that God is going to come through. And suddenly, 
he shows up. It's when we get from believing to knowing. We need to have a deeper relationship with the Father. He needs to be so real in us that we're just like this. We're in union with him. You know, I was talking about, you know, I mentioned Josh last week. You know, my covenant brother, my best friend. You know, he's, he's like, man, we were spiritual weightlifting partners when we were younger, you know. And to this day, we could go year, six months to a year or two years or whatever it is, a length of time, and not talking. And then once we connect, it's like we never, there was no time wasted. We're right there with each other. You need those spiritual weightlifting partners in your life that will push you and drive you. You know two prime uh, spiritual weightlifting partners that you can see? Jerry Savelle and Kenneth Copeland. They're always pushing each other. They're always pushing each other. I heard Dr. Savelle say one time that all these years of me knowing Kenneth Copeland, that man is still challenging my faith in my walk with God. Thank you, Jesus. So you need that person in your life that will pick you up when you don't feel like praying. That'll... that'll push you to go to church when you don't want to go to church. I mean, when I say go to church, I mean go to church when praise and worship practice is going on. Just to get in the presence of God anytime you can. That's hunger. I'm talking about developing a hunger for God on the inside. You want revival? That's where it starts. It starts right here. Man, thank you, Jesus. So I look at men like John G. Lake and Smith Wigglesworth, two men who had such a walk with the Lord that the supernatural was in manifestation. You heard Pastor Jim over the weekend talk about Smith Wigglesworth had 22 people raised from the dead in his ministry. John G. Lake, I mean the supernatural power of God that operated in this man's life. There was a village in Africa that was struck with malaria and, and he wanted to go in to pray for them and get them healed and the, the authorities and the scientists wouldn't let them in and he said, all right, I tell you what, you, take a, you have the virus, the malaria virus, I want you to drop it in my hand underneath the microscope and watch it die. And when, and when he put his hand underneath the microscope, they dropped this virus of malaria in his hand and it disintegrated in front of their eyes. And they said, yeah, you can go in there. And, and he got the whole entire village healed of malaria. That's what I'm talking about. Doing greater things than what Jesus did. But we need to know him. So, let's get into this. We're going to have a good time tonight. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, My beloved ones, don't ever limit your joy or fail to rejoice in the wonderful experience of knowing God. Our Lord Jesus. How many of you know that there is a, an experience? 
said, don't ever limit your joy. The Bible says that joy unspeakable and full of glory. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Bible says that a merry heart does good like a medicine. How many of you can quote the second half of that scripture? Did you know there's a second half of that scripture? But a crushed spirit dries the bones. I'm not talking about a feeling. Because happiness is a feeling. Joy is a spiritual force. Joy is a fruit of the Holy Ghost. Joy will, will ground you to the, work, to the bedrock of God's strength in your life. And when there is a storm that is coming, you will smile. You'll sit there and be like, yes, Jesus, I know you got it. Yes, Jesus. I am not moved by what I see, but I am only moved by the word of God. It is your strength. I'd venture to say the, uh, the children of God that call me for prayer request, that their world is in turmoil, that they don't know him. They believe him. Because if they knew him, their confidence would rest in his deliverance. Their eyes would be on, on him and not the storm. Hey Amen. Man, I am preaching myself happy today. So, now check this out. Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 8, to truly know him meant letting go of everything from my past, throwing all my boasting on the garbage heap. It's like a pile of manure to me now so that I may be enriched in the reality of knowing Jesus Christ and embrace him as Lord in all of his greatness. He said, to truly know him means to let go of my past. In, uh, over in verse 12 or 13, he says, I have one compelling focus. And that is to forget the past and to fasten my heart to the future. In the verses above, you will see that, starting in verse 5, you will see that Paul goes, Hey, I'm the chiefest of Hebrews. I was a Pharisee. I know my stuff. I know the word of God back and forth better than any man, any Pharisee. And oh yeah, by the way, I, I murder Christians. To truly know him is to forget the past. Have you ever noticed those, uh, those Christians or people, especially Christians, that, that, that they're just, that they live in the past? They're always reliving their past mistakes. They're always living back there because they can't find themselves to forgive themselves of their past mistakes. Have you ever noticed that they spiritually stink? Right? Why? It's because they're living their life on a garbage pile. Here's a good picture of what I'm talking about. How many of you have watched the Peanuts? Or Charlie Brown? Come on. You live in Minnesota. Charlie Brown's from, you, it's from Minnesota. I didn't know that until I moved here. When I found out, I was like, we were driving around St. Paul one time when I first moved up here. I was like, 
Why is Snoopy everywhere? Why is Charlie Brown everywhere? Well, you know, he's from Minnesota. I'm like, what? Couldn't believe that. Pigpen. How many of you remember Pigpen? They're walking around with a cloud of dust. They can't seem to get clean. Why? Because the past is where Satan lives. The past is where he brings condemnation and he's condemning you. He's making you feel a guilt and shame. In order to truly know him means you've got to forgive yourself of your past mistakes and move forward. All right, now, I'm going to show you something. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Psalm 139, verse 5. Listen, listen to how good God is. You've gone into my future to prepare the way. And in kindness, you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. With your hand of love upon my life, you impart a blessing to me. Amen. He loves you so much that he goes in front of you to prepare the way. But then he goes behind you to protect you from your past mistakes. If you want to move forward in God, you have to forget the past. Now notice this. He says, it's all like a pile of manure to me now. Like a pile of manure. I know this part of the message is going to stink a little bit, but it's in the Bible. I'm just quoting the Bible. But notice, why did he count it as manure? Because manure is used as a fertilizer. Manure is used to help grow the vegetables that we eat to bring nutrients. It will strengthen the plants that you're planting Manure, but notice if you use the wrong type of manure, it will kill. The people who can't forget the past are feeding on the wrong manure in their life. And they're spiritually dying because they can't forgive themselves. I know what I'm talking about because I was this guy one, at one point in my life. I couldn't forgive myself of the mistakes that I made. I spiritually stunk. I almost lost my whole entire family. My family was in wreck. But thank God I had an encounter with him, an encounter with love. He says, my passion is to be consumed by him. You want to move in God, then you must have passion. You want to know him, you have to have passion. You have, how do you, how do you develop this passion? Paul says, he tells uh, Timothy, therefore I remind you in 2 Timothy 1 6, he says, Stir up the gift of God which is inside of you. Stir up the gift of God. In Rick Renner's book, A Life of Blaze, that phrase, stir up the gift, is a one Greek word compounded with three different Greek words. Don't ask me how to say it because I am not going to attempt it. 
But what he said is, what that meaning of that, of that Greek word is, you fan the flame. The NIV actually says to fan the flame. To fan the gift of God on the inside of you. Fan the flame. Fan the fire. You have to poke. It says that Greek word is poke, prod. It's like, it's like a, a campfire or, or a fire in your, in your fireplace, in your house. You know, the ones that has real wood, not, not the fake stuff, right? You know, so I'm just clarifying, you know. But if you don't tend to the fire, the fire will burn out. If you don't tend to the flame, tend to the passion, the fire will burn out. How do you... Stir the gift of God on the inside of you. One way is praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that when you pray in the Holy Ghost, you're building your utmost holy faith. Man, pray in the Holy Ghost. I can't tell you how important that is. Praying in the Holy Ghost. I find myself praying in the Holy Ghost everywhere I go. In the grocery store, at work. Well, you work at a, you work at a church, so it's okay. Well, what a lot of people don't know is a year and a half ago, I was bored. At, I was bored, man. My, we're empty nesters. Hallelujah. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. No more of that responsibility. And so I was getting bored because my wife, dear Lord, she goes to bed early. I mean early. When we first got married, she was like, hey, it's 6.30, man. I'm about to, I'm dragging. I need to go to bed. You want to come to bed with me? I said, that lasted for two weeks. <laughs> so I'm like, honey, I'll, I'll come to bed with you, but as soon as you fall asleep, I'm out of here. Because I'm a night owl, you know. But um, so, so, uh, so I was like, you know, you, you, so I, I was bored. So I, I started, I got a job at UPS. It was only supposed to be until December, you know. And man, I love it so much. I've been there a year and a half now. Just, I, I get paid to work out. You know that? I get, that's the way I view it. But man, I, I love the relationships I am building. Relational evangelism one on one is in action right now. Amen. So I pray in the Holy Ghost while I'm at UPS. I, I'm praying. I got my earphones in, I'm listening to worship music or somebody preaching to me, and I'm praying in the Holy Ghost. Man, I, I take Jesus with me. And let me tell you, when, when you are in union, when, you are, when you're living a life of passion of Jesus, you don't have to wear a Christian t-shirt or wear a cross. And there's nothing wrong with that. I, I wear that stuff, right? But people will know you. I had been working there for a few months, and there was this one guy. I was always, he was always wearing uh, uh, Batman T-shirts or Spider-Man. He was always wearing a superhero T-shirt. And any time the belt would stop and he was right there with me, I'd strike up a conversation. So what's your favorite Batman movie? You know, and we, we'd talk about Batman. Right? I would talk about whatever superhero was on his shirt. Then one day, we're working really closely together, and we're walking together. And he goes, so is this your only gig, or do you have a full-time gig? I have a full-time gig. Oh, okay. What, what's your full-time gig? Oh, I work at a church. Oh, which church? Living Word. Living Word. Huh. Is that the church with the big sign off of 169? Yep. Well, what do you do there? Well, I'm a pastor on staff. And then he said this, oh, that makes so much sense now. I said, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? 
And he goes, well, I don't go to church anymore, but my mom used to send me to youth camps, and I, I used to be around a lot of pastors. I've been around different churches, you know. I've been, I was raised that way. I couldn't figure out what was different about you until just now because you have this overwhelming calm of a pastor. And everybody's freaking out because something's not going right. It's all right. We got this. See, I'm bringing light. And a lot of the folks don't even realize it. Amen. You're just praying the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you. Thank you, Jesus. You know, a lot of the things I've said tonight is not in my notes. Let me tell you that right now. But praise the Lord. But let me, uh, I'm going to dig into something. So we need a... Ways to, to develop a passion for him is do we pray more? Yeah. Do we read the word more? Yeah, that will work. Do we go to church more? That will definitely help. Let me tell you what my youth pastor told me, told us. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Right? Pray without ceasing. The Bible also says meditate on the word day and night. How do you do that? You don't go to a gym on day one expecting to bench 500 pounds. You kill yourself. Especially if you can't, if you can only bench press five. <laughs> so what you do is if you're if, condition word, if you're consistent with going to the gym every day and bench pressing those five pounds, eventually those five pounds will be too light. You say, hey boys, put on the weight. And you press, you press. If you stay consistently constant and constantly consistent, you will eventually get to the point where you're benching 500 pounds. So you want to meditate on the word day and night? You want to pray without ceasing? This is what you do. You simply... Start out with what you can handle. Pastor, all I can handle spiritually is just one Bible verse. Well, be consistent in reading one Bible verse every single day. One Bible verse will turn into two, will turn into five, will turn into 15, will turn into a whole chapter, into two chapters, into three chapters to where you're going all day long thinking about his word. But it starts with one Bible verse. Man, I want to pray without ceasing. But pastor, I can only pray for five minutes. Well, start out being consistent with praying for five minutes every day. Five will turn into ten. Ten will turn into twenty, thirty, fifty, sixty minutes. Two. Smith Wigglesworth, somebody asked him, how often do you, how, how long do you pray? Smith Wigglesworth, I only pray for five minutes. However, I never go five minutes without praying. You can get to the point where you are so in union with him that God will use you to pray at night in your sleep. I'll never forget, we're summer camp. I think this was in uh, 
Hot Springs, Arkansas. And I was on the top bunk in the corner of the room. Then Josh was on the top bunk over here. And I don't know which one, but one of the Murphy twins, Eric and Vince, or Vince, was sleeping on the top bunk between us. And he said, next morning, I was like, hey, did you get a good night's sleep? Did you sleep good? He goes, no. Why? You woke me up in the middle of the night. I said, what? Yeah. Hey, you were sound asleep, and you were praying in the Holy Ghost. And you were just going. And finally, when you shut up, I was like, I turned over and I was about to fall asleep. And then Josh starts, wakes me up, praying in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> that, that union, that union with him, being one. Me and Josh, we were, we, 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 we were spiritual weightlifting partners. We pushed each other all the time. I mean, we, we would preach to each other. We would pray for each other. We would challenge each other. Got to the point where, where we became so in line with each other that we didn't realize it until he showed up to church all the time wearing the exact same Christian t-shirt as I was wearing. There was times where I'd, I'd pull up. I'd pull up to pick him up to go to church, and he'd get in the, jump in the car all excited, and he goes, oh, man, let me go change my shirt. <laughs> That's unity. That's becoming one. And our visions was aligning with each other. You know, when, when, when you're like that with your spouse... You can finish each other's sentences. Can you finish Jesus' sentence? So, we're going to wrap this up into my last point. I believe we'll find the answer of this intimacy with Jesus within the Lord's table. Now, I'm going to, what I'm about to teach you, I did not come up with myself. While I was at Jerry Savelle's Bible school, he brought a man in for a whole week to teach us. This man, his name is Dick Rubin. He is a uh, Messianic Jew that is full of the Holy Ghost. How many of you remember the Brownsville Revival? Remember that in the early 90s, mid 90s, where there was an outpouring of Revival down there in Pensacola, Florida at the Brownsville Assemblies of God. I mean, they had every day for, I can't remember, how long? How, many, how long did that revival last? I mean, a long time. Power of God, people were just coming and, and getting saved every day. They were getting hundreds of people saved and they were just coming to church. Well, a year before this revival manifested in this church, Dick Rubin was in their church teaching the same thing that Dr. Savell brought him to teach us. You can go to dickrubin.org and get this series for yourself. I actually have this, the comparison study guide right here. It's called, When the Pattern is Right, the Glory Falls. His whole entire ministry is based on showing you the types and shadows of the Old Testament and showing you where they 
are fulfilled in the new. For instance, I'll give you one instance. The menorah. The lampstand. Some translation says candle. You know, it's not, it, it was lamps back then. It's, it describes that there's a center post, center lamp with three lamps that branches off from the center stem. And on it is, on the three lamp stands, on the branches, is a, a series of buds, knots, and bulbs of three on each thing. Okay? But on the center, there's four instances of buzz, knots, and bulbs of three. Okay? If you do the multiplication on the three branches, you'll get a number 27 on each side. And if you do the math just on the center lamp, you get 12. When you add the 12 with the ones, with the 27 on the left, you get a total of 39. With a grand total of 66, buds, knots, and bulbs. So the, the lamp in the tabernacle, the menorah, is a representation of God's word. Anointed with oil and fire of the Holy Ghost. If you want to be perfected, you need, the, you need the whole entire word in your life, not just the new. There are things that you need to know in the Old Testament as well. We had denominations that discards the Old Testament. It's all for us. Every bit of it. But I'm getting sidetracked. So it is 8.16 right now. We're going to make this fast because Dick Rubin actually taught this for two hours. Are you ready? We should be out of here by midnight. No. But I'm going to go through this really quickly. He talks about In 1 Corinthians 1 9, it says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Corinthians 10 16, he says, Paul says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? That word communion in the Greek is kononia. Kononia means social intercourse. Intimacy. Notice in Genesis, the Bible says that Adam knew Eve and they had a baby. Luke says that Joseph knew not Mary until after Jesus was born. Social intercourse. We find intimacy in the bread, in the breaking of bread. 
really quick. I have three matzah breads right here. This is unleavened bread. This is still made today the way God told them to make it in the days of Moses. Once a year, they will take the matzah. And then they always, Jewish custom is to this day, they take the stack on the night of Passover. They won't take the top one and they won't take the second one. They take the middle. The middle matzah has a name. Athi Coleman. They will say a prayer, a blessing. Athi Coleman means I came. If you look at the matzah, you will see that it is striped. You will see that this matzah has no leaven in it. You will see that it is pierced. Who came for our transgressions? Who came for our healing? What they will do is they will break this and say a blessing. And then they will take a, a portion of it. And uh, they will wrap part of it in a linen cloth and then they will tuck it away in their, uh, their dresser and any time that they're sick they will go to the Athi Coleman they'll break off a piece and they will, they will say a prayer of God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob I thank you for the name that this bread represents. And I receive my healing right now. They're taking Jesus and don't even realize it. So today we're going to have communion tonight. And then we're going to have them, uh, the praise and worship team is going to come. We're going to worship. And then what the ushers are going to bring the elements up here, up front. And then during the worship, I want you to come down and take the elements. We're going to worship before the Lord. And we're going to get intimate with our Father. Amen. So come on. Thank you, Jesus. to fight.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Is your heart burning for him tonight? We gave you matzah today instead of the wafer. Because I want you to see as you're taking the bread that you're seeing Jesus. If you need healing in your life today, it could be spiritually, it could be a broken heart because he did say that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to heal the brokenhearted. So as we take communion, let's thank Him for the intimacy. And I'm going to do it a little bit different tonight. I'm actually going to bless the bread and the wine with the Jewish blessing that that they bless the bread and wine with. Notice you had two disciples that were walking. They were, dis- they were despondent because Jesus died on the cross. And Jesus shows up and says, what's going on, fellas? They don't even recognize him. And they spend the whole day, and he's explaining the word of God to them. But the moment that he broke bread, they recognized him. The very first thing that Jesus instituted in the church was the Lord's table. Dick Rubin goes through and he proves to you that they either took it daily or at least once a week. You can take communion at church. So Lord, I thank you, Father, for for this passion and this burning in our hearts, Lord. Lord, drive us. I thank you, Father, that you're birthing an intimacy with you, Lord. The Bible says that your word says that deep calls out unto deep. Lord, I thank you, Father, that we're going to the deep waters where you live in Jesus' name. So as we take the bread, praise you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And we break it in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for what your blood did for us, redeeming us from all the hurts and pains. So I thank you, Father, for sending your Son to save us, to redeem us. Lord, I thank you. Lord, we take this cup and we praise you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And we take this in remembrance of you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Father. Lord, as this song says, that we just sang, burn with us. Lord, let this passion for you just burn on the inside of us, Father. As we go out today for the rest of the week 
and next week. And the Lord just, Lord, help us with this passion. Lord, help us today. Lord, is my is my desire that when people see me, they don't see me, but they see you. Lord, I thank you, Father. I'm identifying with the words of John the Baptist. I must decrease so that he can increase. So Jesus, increase in our lives. Purge the self out of us. All of you and none of me I thank you, Father. That you're doing a new work in all of our lives. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Well, hey, everyone. Thank you for coming to church on a Wednesday night. Come back for Resurrection Sunday. Woo! Glory to God. Y'all are dismissed. <laughs>